Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I am Abe with MysticGenMara.com, a small town mystic from the middle of Idaho. And tonight I would like to introduce or do a book review or however you want to see, you see this. Um, Scott Cunningham's book, The Complete Book of Incense, Oils, and Brews. Um, this is, as you can tell, I'm <laughs> this thing is so full of notes it's not even funny. Um, this one is one of my favorite books that Scott uh, ever wrote. Um, I have a few of his books that are like, they're always within arm's reach. This is one of them. If you are new to, well, the craft to start with, or if you're just wanting to start working on some new styles of making your own incense versus always having to go buy it, or if you want to learn how to make soaps, there's not like full cold press soaps. But he does have some ideas in here on how to get your um, <laughs> herbs correctly, what kind of oils you can use, things like that. But it's really cool because he goes through and talks about the his mm, historical references, how to make a base for like cone incenses. There's a section on that. That one's on page 52 if you're interested. You can make incense papers, which I didn't even know were a thing until I went through this which those are awesome well, how I would use how I use them was when you're setting intentions or you're making like wishes or things like that you will write it on the incense paper and then as it burns it burns the um, releases the intention they're kind of fun in that respect um, there's ways to make non combustible incense in which case you'll need like little um, charcoal bricks that you can pick up in most health food stores or occult stores and then you can just sprinkle your incense on when you make those kind one heads up on that especially if you live in a place where <laughs> you have uh, fire alarms when you use the charcoal burners and you use homemade incense that's non-combustible so it has to be heated up on the charcoal burner the amount of smoke that comes off that thing is substantial so just as a heads up probably not a good idea to use if you're in an apartment but they have he tells, talks about how to make the incense cones, which is way less smoke, um, the incense papers and things like that. And then he breaks down what like the basics are. So simple incenses, just using allspice, uh, gum arabic, bay leaves, uh, copal, dragon's blood. Hmm, sorry about that. Uh, myrrh, thyme, which I've used thyme by itself. It is a very astringent and pungent smell. It's not bad, but it's definitely one that, if you're not ready for it, <laughs> can be a little intense. But he goes through and breaks down the different incenses. Like there's a abramelin incense, there's apparition incenses, which he does have a cautionary note. And he puts notes on things, like for the apparition one, it uses uh, hemp. And he's not talking about cannabis he's talking about actual like hemp rope types hemp um, and it's one of those things that he was always really good about giving you heads up and all of his work that I've ever read um, he's really good about letting you know what was traditionally done versus what is commonly done just because it was a traditional recipe doesn't mean we should probably be doing it today <laughs> And that's some of the stuff that he talks about. So a lot of the times when you see some of his little footnotes, because you'll put a little asterisk on it, like with the hemp one, I'm not sure if I can get this close enough. There's an asterisk right there. Um, and it just means that this was something that used with caution or preferably don't put this in, however. But when you look at what's in the apparition, or apparition incense, wood, aloe, coriander, camphor, mugwort, flax, anise, cardamom, chicory, and hemp. Well, I know for a fact there's a couple of those when brewed or prepared properly, you're going to see stuff. <laughs> so it's definitely one of those ones where it's used with caution and preferably don't use at all. But then he goes through, there's like business incenses, um, consecration incenses, um, how, like a circle incense. So if you're a um, Wiccan and you're make, casting your circle when you use the air uh, as your element you can use this particular incense and you can make these as big or as small as you want that's the beauty of it 
because a lot of these he just gives you how many parts. So four parts frankincense, two parts myrrh. I'm not going to go through the rest of it, but um, you can use a teaspoon. You can use a weight scale, like so many grams or uh, milligrams or however. So you get to decide how much of this you actually want to make. And when you first start out, let me just give you the heads up. Have your one part or your half part be a quarter of a teaspoon. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> because when you have multiple things in there and it's like a half a part of this, two parts of that, and by the time you're done, you've got like two cups of stuff. And so if you break it down and you start with a teeny tiny amount, like a quarter of a teaspoon, you're not going to have too much. You can find out if you actually like the fragrance once it's being burnt. Because the nice thing or the fun thing about this is when you make it from scratch, you get to experience the process and you smell everything as it's being prepared. And that's awesome. But then you go to burn it and the smell is completely different. <laughs> so you definitely want to make sure that you're not overdoing. And some of these ingredients like actual frankincense tears, copal resin, things like that can be a little bit on the pricey side, depending on where you get it and how ethical they are. Um, so you definitely want to be careful with what you're getting and how much because it can you can really dump some serious money into these things. But there's a, a whole section on different incenses and let's bounce ahead a little bit. There's even a section for you romantics out there for love incenses. I think he's got two or three in here. Uh, one, two, two love incenses. Um, some Mars. I think there was a lust one somewhere too. But there's several incenses for that. Um, each of the eight Sabbaths, there is a incense for. Uh, some of them, like Midsummer, has two incenses depending on which you would rather one's really floral the other one's very resin heavy which I would prefer that one personally I'm not a big fan of the uber floral mm, pardon me um the uber floral scents like chamomile gardenia rose lavender yarrow those are the floral a aspects of it and that makes up a significant portion of that incense I, no. but the other one has a base of frankincense benzoin and these are all resins, dragon's blood, and then you get into herbals, which is thyme and rosemary, things like that. That, totally down with. But I've also burnt each one of those individually, so I know what I'm getting into. <laughs> um, there's the nine woods, there's a Pele, different zodiac, Pisces, and Leo, and things like that for incense bases, or incense starters. And he gives you, if I could get into it, I had all these things bookmarked, but I have too many bookmarks in here, so I can't find which one. Uh, he gives you in the back of this book substitutions so if it's like I don't really want to use that particular product so you can use uh, oops that's the wrong one that's the <laughs> Latin name sorry about that um, where is it oh there it is table of magical substitutions in the very back it's page 213 in this particular edition so you can go through and if you don't have one of the resins or one of the herbs you can substitute it if you have some of his other work you literally can go in find out the properties are and bounce over he does have a small glossary section in the back here that talks about what the different oops too far um, like there's fire there's a section for herbs on earth or plants I should say there's a, uh, astrological symbols and what they mean and with the letters behind it it generally tells you how you can use it um, like the allspice you can use it as an herb but like basil you have an herb or an oil so you've got a couple of different options when you're working in that department he goes through how to get your oils um, the other thing with the way Scott would write is he always wanted the products you're bringing into your rituals or in general your home to be ethical or at least all natural today we would say non-gmo organic or up the list from there because what you're bringing into your home what you're using in your ritual if it is not ethical if it is not pure how well do you think your ritual is going to work how well do you think your intention is going to go out in the world don't get me wrong you can still do really well with just simple tap water but if you put the effort into getting the more clean uh, products, you're going to have a much better result overall. 
like a lot of the times when you're in a hurry, you need salt, you just go to the store, you buy the dollar salt container. If you're doing a really important ritual, like you're calling upon Venus or Aphrodite, getting a nice, clean sea salt is going to be a better option, like a good gray Celtic sea salt or something along that line, because it's setting you into that mindset, I've been working with this type of energy. So when you put in the effort to get the more, and honestly, <laughs> I've been around enough years, I've dealt with enough of this stuff, you can get really good, high quality essential oils and carrier oils for a super affordable price. And little secret, he talks about it in here, if you don't want to go spend a fortune on say exotic jojoba or apricot or something like that, go to the cooking aisle and get organic avocado oil, get organic sesame oil, get organic, not coconuts, too stiff, get organic whatever oil. You're going to pay significantly less and as a carrier oil it's still going to work. Don't use uh, canola, or not canola, yeah don't probably use canola anyway, but find a nice cold pressed oil and there are a lot of them out there um, like I said avocado is really affordable grape seed is another good one just for this purpose it's super affordable but it's things like that that you can shave off some of the pennies but still get a quality product and that's the kind of stuff that he talks about um, sesame if it's toasted it's gonna have a very strong aroma if it's untoasted it's gonna be more subtle so you're not gonna have to worry about that interfering um, avocado is nice because it doesn't really have a smell, has a little bit of a color but not a smell. Uh, same thing with grape seed, you're not going to have a big smell with it. There are people that I know who've tried peanut oil, I personally keep that in the kitchen where it belongs to cook with, but you can pick and choose. But that's just what I'm saying is if you want to save a couple of pennies, trust me, you're, if you're getting organic and it's food grade, it's you're not going to have any difference. Um, then he goes through the different oils, what do they mean, several of them, and he puts like notes, clove oil, it has an irritant, and it can, some people actually get a little bit of a, like itches and stings, um, and then he gives you an approximate usage, like for clove, if you were to use it, you would add one or two drops to an eighth of a cup of carrier, so two tablespoons or give or take of your carrier oil, and then you put in one or two drops of the clove because you're using it for the ritual aroma you're not using it for like skincare at that point so he gives you all of that kind of information which is really great and then he goes into the different recipes and most all of the recipes in here he uses a carrier base of an eighth to a quarter of a cup of oil that may not sound like a lot but when you think about what anointing oil is you're putting it in a two ounce little um, dropper bottle and you're using one to three drops for each ritual you make an eighth of a cup to a quarter of a cup of a Capricorn oil <laughs> you will have Capricorn oil to share with all of your friends for the next 20 years <laughs> it is significant amounts so he purposely gears it down to very small quantities so that you can actually use it before it goes it doesn't really go bad it just starts to sour if it gets too warm or gets in the sunlight um, but like they have earth o elemental oil four drops but truly a little bit of cypress and something and some other stuff in there too we're not like I said I'm not gonna read into all of those um, but we're talking drops in just that small amount of oil you're not looking for a medicinal response you're looking for the aroma which is going to trigger a spiritual or energetic response and that's the beauty of what he does in this book is he talks about all that he then from oils we go into some we're starting our brews because now we're getting into ointments and he talks about the basics of them you can use um, shortening and there are some actually some organic like coconut based shortenings they're not like coconut oil where it's more firm it's actually softer than that there is using that um, he said you can even use like things like Crisco I personally would not that's disgusting just as from a <laughs> just from a texture of concept no good um, but he talks about you can use beeswax with a little bit of olive oil to mellow it out but he talks about how to make your own ointment bases and then goes through different ointment recipes there's even one for exorcism um, he talks about and if you've ever looked very far into Wicca or the ancient witch cults and all that kind of stuff not just the fairy tales but like actually dug into it 
they talk a lot about this stuff called flying ointment. Flying, L-Y-I-N-G, ointment. He has the safe methods. He's got two different safe ones in here, which I've tried, and they actually do help you, um, especially in deep meditation, they help you shift into that more almost astral projection type energy, which is pretty helpful, especially when you're first starting. But he also gives the <laughs> original, traditional, whatever you want to call it, recipes. Some of these are really not safe. I mean, and not safe as in they're using actual poisonous plants in them. But one of them, and I always laugh when I read through this because it makes me giggle, it's bad because of what it uses as its base. You use it straight up, and it has to be this, hog's lard. Can't be from a sow, it has to be from a male boar to make this particular potion work, where I'm like, that's disgusting, why would you do that? Um, and then it has a bunch of other unpleasantness in it. But... And he straight up says these are strictly for historical use. There's some of them that he says that about because in that time period, you couldn't talk about things like hemp because that was oh, a big scare. Uh, and now it's more people have figured it out that it's actually not that big of a deal, especially hemp. There's not THC, at least not levels high enough to do anything with in industrialized hemp. And that's what he's referencing most of the time. He will say if it's the other product in here, so just heads up on that. Um, but then he talks about lust ointments that you can use like on your pulse points, your wrists, your back of your throat. Um, there's some other places you can place them, and he does tell you where they're allowed to go. Uh, he talks about how to make magical inks. Um, obviously, I've tried this one. Uh, some of them are kind of simple and basic, like you can use saffron really expensive but you'll need a couple little grains makes a very interesting um, yellow to orange depending on how much you use exceptionally pricey just as we're heads up then he goes through um, tinctures now as I've talked with other videos about alchemical tinctures what he's talking about are, medis or are magical tinctures these are generally not meant to be taken internally they're used as um, sprinkles on incense they're used to anoint paper things like that you're generally there's a couple of them that wouldn't hurt to take internally but for the most part he is talking about them strictly from an external standpoint and then he goes through the different ones money tinctures third eye tinctures and you just would apply it like you would an anointing oil or an ointment to those locations um, then my favorite section really in this book this book is amazing, personally. I love everything about it. But he goes through ritual baths. And he did a lot of his, the art. Him and a friend of his did a lot of the art in here. So there's some cool paint, um, sketches. And he talks about how you can use herbal baths instead of just dumping everything in there, which looks really cool in the movies. But then there's this part in my brain every time I see it is like, ugh, then you have to clean the bathtub out, gross. Um, and he take accounts for that. You use sachets, little cotton bags. Like you can go to the health food store and pick up the little cotton tea bags. Package of tens, like five bucks. Might be a little bit more than that, depending on inflation now. But they used to be sh pretty cheap. You put your stuff in there. You hang it in the water. Fill the t or put it in the tub. Fill the tub with water. Slosh that little tea bag around in there, and you may you have a magical bathtub. And you don't have herbs stuck to everything, including you. So those are kind of nice. But he has like anti-hex. So if you feel like you've got someone coming after you, there's that. Um, aphrodisiac for you and that special someone. Or a beauty. You want to go out and you want to feel extra special that night. Um, there are divination baths. There's ones for energy. And we're taught like if you're a Reiki practitioner and you're feeling depleted, that would be one to try. Um, there's healing ones, several several love recipes, several money ones, um, general purification. And now, when we talk ritual purification, um, in the way he's describing it, he even says it's adapted from the key of Solomon. So this is what you would do as a ritual before high magic, not like Wicca. You, there are per, uh, purification rites for that as well. But when you do the higher magic, the more complex magic where you're actually dealing with some pretty interesting spiritual forces, 
you want to make sure that everything is clean, your body as well as your aura and your mind, and that's where the ritual baths like that come into play. So those are a little more intensive. Um, he also does talk about using bath salts, like Epsom salts. Um, oh. <laughs> I, I told you, I have paperwork all through this thing because this is a very, very special book for, as far as I'm concerned. His best basic mix of bath salts are Epsom baking soda and table salt, or you can even use borax. They're not going to be rough to your skin. It's going to actually be pretty healthy, um, and it's not going to leave residue in the bathtub. That being said, what you add might add the residue. <laughs> so we have, um, again, various elements. There's a healing bath. There's a couple of different protection. There's ones to increase your um, psychic or intuitive abilities. And then we get into the bruise. Now, the bruise are interesting because, you know, you have your cauldron double, double toil and trouble is just <laughs> stirring your kettle. Um, some of these are stuff you can actually drink. There's other ones that are straight up used as offerings for the deities because that's not what they're meant for. Some are classified as teas, like um, there's a dream tea right here. He also gives the heads up on certain ones that are safe to drink but could be miserable to drink. Uh, for example, exorcism brew. Cool. You've got rosemary, bay, and then you have cayenne pepper. <laughs> so it's not going to hurt in the fact of your body is not going to you're not going to be sick and die from it. You're going to be in pain though if you drink that. Um, and so a lot of these brews you're using to like steep crystals in. You're using them, like I said, to offer to the four quarters or um, anoint your house with it. That's what his brews are generally for in that respect. Then there's the ritual soaps and how to make liquid versus solid. Um, and he usually uses, um, where did it go? The glycerin based soap bases. But if you know how to make cold pressed soap, that's not a bad idea. Then he gives you the recipes of the oils to go with it. Again, he does it in um, parts so you can adjust for quantity however you need. Then he goes through um, like herbal charms, little sachets that you'd wear around your neck. Um, similar to what you would call the uh, the voodoo bags. I can't remember what the exact name is off the top of my head. But he also talks about magical powders. And he says this, and I will repeat it as well. If you're going to make magical powders for sprinkling over candles or things like that, you can use like a coffee grinder. But I'm, I, I personally advise against that, and so does he because when you have a mortar and pestle and you have to do it by hand, there's some stuff you need to start with a coffee grinder like cloves and star anise and things like that. But the rest of it needs to be done at least blending with a mortar and pestle because you're putting your intention, your effort, and your energy into your powder as well. So you're amplifying what is already there. Um, Powders are really handy for a lot of reasons because sometimes you can't have incense or you don't want to put oil all over your door, but you can sprinkle a powder in front of it and it lasts and works just as well. So you've got a couple of different versions of that. He goes through in the very end, it's just a mix of different recipes. He talks about how to make a proper bale fire, how to do the frankincense necklaces for protection, uh, especially against negative spiritual attacks. There's... Um, little pillows for sleeping, dreams, uh, basically the proper way to fill them, what to use in them, what's safe to use in them. Whoops. Ah, no. Um, but he go that's, that's the reason I like this book, is he goes through all of the stuff that's super uh, important. He talks uh, towards the end of it, things to substitute instead of using some of the more toxic ingredients. dropping stuff all over the place here. Um, he gives you a list of substitutions. You can use like tobacco, like just the purchase little sprinkle tobacco. Um, in a lot of these recipes, they'll talk about some kind of animal fat or things like that in some of the older ones. You can substitute copal, pine resin, dragon's blood. Um, there are several uh, more toxic products 
especially in your exorcisms and things like that. The easiest way to substitute that is asphoida. <laughs> Let me make one thing clear with that. Do not bring that into your home. Do that outside. Take it out camping. Burn it out there. That is a, it's a good seasoning in certain Indian dishes. Um, the country India, India. But it is so pungent. And when it's burnt, ugh, does it, trust me, you don't want that in your house. Um, but it goes through the different things you can use as substitutions as well. And it's a really fascinating book. Just the way he goes through everything, he's very thorough with how he comes across. And if you've ever read anything by Cunningham, Scott Cunningham, you'll know that it's its almost like you're sitting there having a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and you're just chatting. It is so free thought on how it comes across. The little warnings, a little, this is traditional, maybe not do that. They're very clear, they're very concise. Most of the time he explains why you don't want to use this. There's other ones because there are some of the, the things in here in the, tr the traditionals that not to use. He talks about have like belladonna, which is deadly nightshade. And he, he'll tell you, this is a poison, don't do it. He's not going to go into details, just simply poison, no. <laughs> because what more do you need? It's a poisonous plant, don't use it. So... But it's a fascinating book if you are looking to get into um, starting with some of this stuff. It's a good way to get an idea of how to build your bases, how to start getting things together. He has a lot of sample recipes in there. And from there, you can make it whatever you want. But it's a good way, good, good way to get a good, strong foundation into incense, oils, and brews. Um, and like I said, it's done in a very friendly, free thought type way so you can... Oh, I like that idea. I'm not really a big fan of that one, but if I substitute this one ingredient, it's that type of thing. Like I said, there's <laughs> tons of notes in there. This book is one that I don't share with many people, be, or I will never loan it out. You can look at it at my house. Otherwise, you're not going to see this book because there's so much notes and bookmarks and tags and uh, recipe ideas and substitutions I've figured out over the years. But it's worth get picking up, especially if you're into that kind of stuff. So with that, I'll wrap this up. Um, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button, drop a like, and comment if you've actually read this book or if it's something that you're interested in. And I will see you in the next video.